Hello and welcome back to Behold the Lamb Presents. My name is Chris Shelton. I want to thank you for taking time to study with us again today. It's a little different. We're, pastor's going to go a little longer. We're not going to have the music or anything today, but it's all good. He is going to be speaking about who and what the true church is and what this great red dragon has to do with the church. Could it be that this dragon as depicted in, in Revelation chapter 12 is out to kill, steal, and destroy the church? And when does this last remnant church actually begin? Is there any time period that's depicted in scripture that would tell us where we are in the stream of prophetic history? Friends, I believe there is. And Pastor Kenny is going to go through many of those passages with you. And hopefully at the end of this message, you're going to say, you know what? We need to have this information. We need not be drunk with the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We need to be called out of Babylon, out of spiritual confusion, and into that marvelous light of truth and stand for truth no matter what. Be a part of God's remnant church, won't you? Stay tuned with us today. I know you'll be blessed. Thank you for joining us once again here at Behold the Lamb Ministry. You know, we thank God for you. We're glad that you join us, you know, each and every time we open the pages of God's Word and we study, and we want to learn what truth is. We want to be drawn closer to Jesus. Today, we're going to be looking at, to me, as a fascinating subject. Some people are going to get, I want to say, a little bit tight. You know, might get a little tight about it, but you know what? We need to focus on what Scripture has to say. You know, as, as we look, we're going to be reading Revelation chapter 12, you know, about the great red dragon. Some of you probably have never read that. Somebody's probably never heard that in the Word of God. But we're going to see, and I'm going to start with a question before I have prayer. I think it's a very, very important question, and by the grace of God, it will be answered today. Have you, have you ever, as a parent, or, you know, you know, maybe you've already raised them and they're grown right now, and you think back, as we all do, about children and raising them and wished we had done this or done something different, you know, while you were raising your family and raising them in a Christian home. Have you ever wondered why it seemed that the old enemy continues to attack even our children? You've raised them in the home. You might say, you know, I, I raised them in the faith. How many times have you heard that? I've raised them in the faith. Uh, I, I did the right thing. I, I had worship with them. We taught them the scripture. We took them to church every week. But what happened? As they got older, they, they left the church. They left the cause of Christ. How did that take place? How did that happen? We're going to answer that in just a moment by a few illustrations and things we go through on this study, which might surprise you. But we need to understand and answer that question. Why is it that the enemy is attacking and continues to attack God's people? Let's pray about it, shall we? I'm going to have a quick prayer, and then we'll go. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you again for your love and your mercy. We thank you for your long-suffering with us. Lord, we realize that we approach this very interesting subject. We pray the Holy Spirit of the living God will touch every heart, every life, every mind. May we be willing to learn what is truth. May we be teachable, all of us. And as we learn these things, we're willing to walk in them. We thank you, Lord, for hearing, for answering prayer. For the power of thy Holy Spirit may it descend upon us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage of Scripture, Revelation chapter 12. Sometime you, you know, read a little bit here. We pray it's going to be a blessing. In Revelation chapter 12, we're going to start with verse 3. And this will set it up just a little bit for what we're going to be talking about today. Revelation chapter 12 beginning with verse 3, 4, and 13. Revelation chapter what? 12, verse what? 3, 4, and then 13. The Bible says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, 
And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. The dragon, notice this, stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast where? To the earth. What did he do? He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. What does all, really all of that mean? You know, is the devil angry with God's people today? Not so angry with those who don't profess him. He's angry with those who want to walk as Christ walked. And so there's issues, the great red dragon. So the main, main emphasis in Revelation chapter 12 is just simply, listen, on the New Testament church. Did we get that? The emphasis, Revelation chapter 12, is on the New Testament church that a lot of people like to talk about, but they don't really want to follow what the Bible has to say about it. John, by the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote some words down, and he used some symbolic language, did he not? And pretty heavy duty. And some people who read it, they just give up automatically when they think about the crowns and the tail and the, the red dragon. They just say, we can't understand it. Why would God put something in the Word that you cannot understand? He would not do it, especially the last book in Revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ and those things that are shortly to come to pass. So there's, we can read the Word of God and we can what? let the Bible interpret itself. Now the church is presented, notice this, the church is presented in Revelation chapter 12 at a time when the Messiah, or Jesus, was about to be born, right, of, of, of a woman. Notice this, what does that mean? She's travailing or crying or in pain to give birth to this, to this child. We'll look at that in just a moment here. But what happens? The woman is getting ready to give birth to the child, and what happens? Oh, of course, Satan is present. Something big's going on, he's always present. Something big in the church going on, he's present. And he wants to work to cause confusion and division and separation and this said, that said, and so on and so forth. But here, he's present. But you know, when he's present, he looks like a dragon, is what the Bible says. He's ready to destroy the baby as soon as it is born or as soon as it arrives. Now, what is it? The dragon is there, Right? The baby's getting ready to be born. The dragon, we know is whom now. We'll look at more. It with the devil and Satan, right? Revelation 12, verse 9. So we know the dragon, what it's talking about here. So the devil is ready to do what? Oh, my. To consume or devour the baby as soon as it's born. And, of course, we understand that, do we not? But put it simple here. In a, very, in a miracle, by a miracle, God, you know, Jesus, the baby, God saves Jesus. Now, we realize he goes through a lot on this earth. We realize that he went to Calvary. We realize that he rose from the grave. But after he rose from the grave, where did he go? Revelation 12, 5 says he went to the what? God's throne. And then now, what happens? The dragon says, now what am I going to do? Right? What am I going to do? Jesus, right? The child, I couldn't devour that. I couldn't get rid of Jesus, as it were. So now what do I do? Well, he says, well, I'm not going to give up. Absolutely. Now the dragon it turns his attention to the mother. And this is the woman. Do you get it? The woman. He turns his attention to the mother. More about that in just a moment. But now the mother is protected. Because the Bible says that the woman fled where? Into the wilderness for 1,260 years. Now what's the dragon going to do? Right? Jesus sitting on the right hand of the father. He's up there. Now the mother. Or that we're talking about the church. We'll look at it in a moment. Is protected because it goes into hiding 1,260 years. Revelation 12, verse 6, jot it down and study. He went into hiding. Now, what does the devil do? Does he give up? No. What he does next, the dragon goes after the children. We wondered, are you talking about, remember, the begin with is sometimes why is our children left the church? Why? We've raised them best we know how to raise them or whatever. But they're no longer with us. Remember, the devil has not given up. He wants the children. And so he begins to work on the children because the children, as it were, are still alive. While there's life, there's hope. Whose children is he after? 
The Bible is very plain about the ones the devil's after. He's after the children that were taught to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus in their home. Are you still with me? That's what the Bible says. We can fight it all we want. We can erase it if we want to. But God knows. We need to live in a time we need to match up with what God says in his word. They've come to love truth. And so the devil begins to work on them, the dragon. Now they become the target of the dragon's attack. He doesn't want them to get away. And so the Bible says he makes war. Is that what the Bible says? He makes war with the saints. He makes war with them, our children. Huh. And for a while, it seems like that he's won. Does it not? It seems like when you read Scripture, sometimes it's like, oh, the devil has won. Because Revelation 13, uh, 7 says he makes war and then he overcomes them. Do you remember? Praise God, the Bible goes on in Revelation chapter 14. The children finally gain the victory through the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way we're going to gain that victory, Revelation 14, 12. Remember, the devil is angry, and he's going after the children or the people, right? God's people who keep the commandments of God. That's what the Bible says here. For Revelation 14, 12 says what? There are, God's people are identified here as those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Does that make sense? That's who the devil is angry at. That's what the Bible says. So the devil, oh, well, he's angry at everybody. Sure he is, but he's not angry with those who he has already. Does that make sense? Why be angry with them? I already have them. Now I'm angry at a little remnant, a little small group, a little bit of people who you know, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Wow. Now what about this pure woman? You talk about a woman in the Old Testament, and we'll find even in the New Testament, Remember, woman represents God's true what? God's true church. Most people say, oh, well, no, I never heard of that. Well, it's time you did. Isn't that right? It's time that you did hear about it to realize God has a church. He's always had a church. And will always be those that are faithful to what he has said in his word. There's no doubt about it. But here in symbolism, it's talking about here a woman getting ready to have a baby. That would be baby would be whom? would be Jesus Christ, New Testament church. Something big was happening. And you'll say, well, I don't know about the woman in the church. Isaiah 54, 5 and 6 quickly says this. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And they, they're talking about the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall be called. Notice verse 6. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman. Come on, church. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith the Lord God. So here we see it right, pushed toward the, that woman, represents God's church, does it not? Yeah. yeah. Lord hath called thee as a woman, is what the Bible says. You say, well, that's, that's not quite enough for me. Well, that's good. Let's look up another, shall we? We know the very familiar one is Jeremiah 6, 2. I'm telling you, dear friends, when you have the opportunity to learn what God is saying, and God says, I have a people, I give you all these identifying marks, and it's just, we don't care about it, we're in trouble. If you don't mind, I'll be plain with you today. You may like it. You may not like it. I don't want to offend anybody, but I want to be truthful with you. Because these words are in the Word of God. If it's not what I'm saying they are, then show me otherwise. Is that, is that fair enough? Show me otherwise. Because that makes sense. Jeremiah 6, 2 Talk about God's people. He said, I have likened the daughter of Zion. That's God's people, isn't it right, Zion? I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So we see God's New Testament church being born in the New Testament. And again, the devil is angry because you know what? they're still advocating keeping the commandments of God and have the testimony or faith of Jesus Christ. Huh. So that we just all can keep it straight. Remember, the church... When it went into apostasy. Now how many times, Israel we talked about in the church. How many times did they go in apostasy? Probably more times than they tried to do the right thing. But when they apostatized in the New Testament time, notice their Old Testament backslide, they were backsliding people. When the woman was backsliding, she was compared to a corrupt woman. You remember that? Jeremiah 3 verse 20. Surely as a wife, as a woman, treacherously dealeth with her husband... 
so have ye right, dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Huh. Interesting. And then a good illustration of right, the uh, church in apostasy is Revelation chapter what? 17. Hello. Revelation chapter 17. And you see that a woman, right, still a woman in Revelation, still is the church. But now the church is dressed like a harlot. The church has decked herself with all kind of jewels, all kind of scarlet and purple, stones and pearls, and has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. You should want to know about those abominations. I need to know about those abominations. I need to know God's church when it's on target, and I need to know the church when it's in apostasy. And I can tell you right now, the church that's in apostasy today are those who are not willing to do what God has said in His Word. That's just the whole bunch. That's all of us. I'm not up here defending a denomination. I'm not defending. I've learned by the grace of God to study to show myself approved unto God. So I'm not champion any kind of this or that or following after this just read the word of God and if it's important to God I know it's important to you I know it's important to me you, you can look at the New Testament at the figure of the woman Second Corinthians 11 verse 2 we just get some of these things out of the way so we know so that we're not confused when we talk about a woman talking about the church when the woman is in apostasy notice what happens when you go into apostasy listen when you become a Christian when you accept Christ and maybe you've been out in the world all your life you've been it's okay just to be honest with you. You're tipping the bottle. You're doing drugs. You're doing everything in the world you shouldn't do. But when you invite Jesus into your heart and your life, pretty soon those things are gone. Isn't that right? They, they, they start going. Jesus lives inside and conviction comes. right. And then, but notice when you go back into the world and you leave Christ, not none of this business once saved, always saved. When you leave Christ and you go back to the world, you start putting on those same things that you took off. You start putting back into your body the same things that you took in before. That shows that we have apostatized. And maybe even today, if you look at your life and I look at my life, as when you were born again. You might have remembered that time. It may have been indelibly imprinted on your mind and your heart the day that you really accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Everything that you talked about was Jesus. Everything that you went to do was about Jesus. It was helping other people. It was telling them that he was coming soon and how to be ready for his coming. It's not just saying, I believe, I believe, I believe. Man, we got to wake up. It's much more than I believe. Yes, you have to believe. But the Bible says the devils believe and they tremble. Is the devil's going to be saved? Absolutely not. So I'm saying we've got to come to grips where we're at in the stream of time, what's happening in the world today. When there's countries, even like, I want to say Canada, even today, they're talking about the last couple of days. They're, they're, they're talking about here, you, you need to be careful. You can't really, you can't put really anything up on the Internet or do whatever they want that's quoting from Scripture. And they, they put up the one about, you know, the LGBTQ and all this business. One, I guess it's, it's one of the parliament just put a little quote up on the scripture like we need to be careful in this area. They called her in and said, listen, we find you guilty of this. We're going to give you two years in prison. Yeah, two years in prison. They're getting to the point where you cannot tell the truth anymore. And you know why? Because this group of certain people... As you well know, LGBTQT and all these, whatever it is, they, you know, they don't want you to talk about that because it exposes the lifestyle. And therefore, even in their, in their own parliament, they said, look, and then there was a, a pastor, a bishop, they called him, that he agreed with that. And so he, put it, he put, sent it on out, and they got him too and said, now, if we don't get something straightened out here, you're going to spend two years in jail. And the bottom line, they're saying this, we don't want printed anymore in a, about, about sin is, is, the, is the transgression. That's all they put. We don't want, why don't you put that? They're trying to take out the definition, the only definition maybe in Scripture, of what sin is. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of God's law. Right? Where there is no, right? No law, there is no sin. Roman talks about. So there has to be a law here. Are we, are we together on this? There has to be something that's going on here. And they're saying, so you can't say Sin is transgression. You know why you can't say it? Because people get their feelings hurt. That was our response. Can you imagine what the world is coming to right now? You can't say that anymore because somebody's going to get upset. Let me tell you, I don't care what you say. It's different people. Somebody's going to get upset. Isn't that right? No one could have said it better than Jesus said it while he was here on earth. They got upset with him and they killed him. Does that make sense? 
So it, we, we need to look at what this world is coming to right now. The devil doesn't want this kind of stuff out. He doesn't want to say, you know, he doesn't want us to hear about the truth of God's Word. And the truth will be for the books of Daniel and Revelation in these last hours of earth's history. If we are not studying this, and that we do hear because we realize they reveal things that are happening in the world. They tell us the things that are happening, and we can see them happening right now. And we say, well, we need to boldly stand for those truths right now. So help us, God. We need to do it. Corrupt woman, good woman. Second Corinthians, I read Second Corinthians 11 too, I'm going to. For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I've espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Ephesians 5, 25 through 38, we're going to read it all, but it becomes very clear. Just jot it down and read it. She, the woman, notice this, represents it the, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament church. Man, this is very important. Let me, you say, well, I need some New Testament passages. Let's read Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Notice this, Acts 7, verse 38. This is he, the way it starts out, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel. Hmm which spake to him in, the, in Mount Sinai. And with our fathers who received, I like this, the lively oracles to give us. Man, somebody needs to shout. Who gave us the what? The lively. You know, most of us don't look alive. We look like we're half asleep. Did you say up all night? Man, alive. That's what it was when Moses came down with the lively oracles. The people were doing all kinds of things, isn't it, right? We don't want to be doing that. Lively oracles means the living oracles. Why? Because they live on and on from generation to generation. They'll never end. God gave them to us to put life in us so that we would know what we should do and what we shouldn't be doing. It's very simple. It says an angel gave it. I wonder who the angel might have been. Oh, it's kind of, to me, it's exciting to read that. Yeah. In, 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 in Acts chapter 7, where we're at, if you read verse 35... And then, of course, read 31. Verse 35 says, a hand of an angel became involved. Verse 31 says, the voice of the Lord spoke. Notice this. Now, let's clarify that as we go to Exodus 32. Remember how you learned out what truth is? What do you do? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little for the truth. You, you, ooh, I almost said you frauds. I don't want to say that. The, fra the fraudulent preachers of today will build a message on two or three or one line. And try to build a doctrine on that. I'm not trying to be ugly about that, but I'm telling you the truth. You cannot learn what truth is if you take one line and you just read it and say, now we're going to build all around it. You go to the Word of God like we just did in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 38. In Acts uh, 7, verse 31. Acts 7, verse 35. Now Exodus chapter 2, 3, verse 2 says this. Notice, the, who is this angel of the Lord? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. Come on. Out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Whoa. Who was in the bush? Somebody was in the bush. <laughs> Somebody was in the bush. It said here, the angel of the Lord, we know it was Jesus. Isn't that right? Jesus Christ. He was in that bush that, burnt, that didn't burn it, burn it up here. If you go a little farther, Revelation 10, verse 1, the Bible talks about there was a mighty angel involved. Who's that mighty angel? Jesus Christ. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, you talk about here, it said that the, the, the good prince, the prince, that's Jesus Christ. Over and over we can find the importance of the message that God has given his last day church here. Might I just add this? May, just please consider this, if you will. I don't mean to be angry and ugly about it, but I'm telling you, with the world falling apart like it is, and we're still playing church, that, I'm not into that. Is that okay? It's not right. Play church. Continue to come every week just exactly the way we are and stay the way that we are. We're not going to be ready for the coming of Jesus. We've got to get excited. We don't, shouldn't have to call people and beg them to come to church. Right? Are you still with me? We shouldn't have to do that. You should want to. Praise God, those of you, you want to. But there's many who will hear the voice and so on. They know they're not doing the right thing. And I'm trying to, by the grace of God, the Holy Spirit, bring conviction on their heart and their soul and their mind. Let me add this. Matthew 18, verse 20. Here's what the Bible said. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. You want to know who God's church is? Do you really want to know? People say, yeah, we do. Well, the Bible just simply says to start with right here, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Where Jesus is, is his church. 
Does that make sense? If he's not here, then we need not have church. I just soon go over there and have fellowship lunch and get it over with. Somebody's not going to get that, right? Some of you will wake up later and say, yeah, I'm going to. If the spirit of living God's not going to be here, if Jesus doesn't approve of what we're doing here, why? Why go on? Why put up a pretext? Why? Oh, it's sad. Right now, the church should be almost on fire. We should be calling the fire department. Are you with me? Yeah, some fire extinguishers. Some Christians will try to do it and put the fire out, but I'd really you'd not do that. But notice Matthew 18, 20, remember, two or three are gathered together. Now, this, listen, this constituted, right, God's church. Are you still with me? This constituted God's church. This old stuff of, well, this is God's church. It's this denomination and that denomination and this denomination. Not going to be saved by no denomination. You might as well get that out of our mind. Get it out quick. You will not be saved by any kind of denomination. So when we hard-headed and we stick with our denomination because mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, they all were this way, so evidently we need to believe this way too. Uh Uh-uh. God holds you accountable for the truth that you understand and know now. Not what mom and daddy did. Not what grandma and grandpa did. Is that that okay? Sometimes we do that. We just stick with what we know and what we've been raised with. No. God is leading a people now into one fold. One unity. But listen, we can't have unity. We can't have unity if we don't know what truth is. How can we have unity in this church if we can't understand what happens when you die, Herb? There can't be unity. If we can't get together, that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It's not the first day. It's not the second day. It's not any other day. It's the seventh day. That's what the Bible says. Man, what nerve that takes. And I'm not trying to be ugly about it because some of you still may be confused about it. But let me tell you, God has good people everywhere. But what is he doing? Oh, Listen, people just want to just sit down and say, well, see, it says God has good people everywhere, so I'm just going to be. He calls them out. Is that true? You don't just stay in Babylon, confusion. He calls you out. How does he call you out? Through maybe messages like this. Or what you see on TV, you've heard truths, you've heard things that just jarred your mind. It's not what you believed all of your life. It's okay, but come out while there's still time. God calls you to come out. God's church, it will always be, it always has been, it will always be. Does that make sense that God has had a people all through the Bible? All through, the, did he not have Israel? Was that not his, was his church, as it were? Was it not? He said Moses was there, was with him, right? And then you said the New Testament time, the Jews were, we still say, God's chosen people. Even though we realize that they, you know, backslid from God, they can be saved independently by themselves, but not as a nation anymore. It's the New Testament church. That's what I want to be a part of, the New Testament church. But we have to be able to agree. We can't set pew, pew, just everybody right here and think we're in good harmony when we believe everything different. Does that make sense? We've got to come to grips if we are true to God. See, somebody's up here saying some of the things I am right now. I'd just challenge him right now. I'd challenge if I believe differently. If I believe differently, that, uh, you know, a subject, for instance, and somebody's up here saying we've got to believe it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge that. I'm going to find out what truth is of what happens when you die. I want to find out the truth about the 2300 days. I want to find out the truth about how Jesus is going to come in the clouds of glory. Isn't that right? I want to, how you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works and all this stuff they're talking about. I want to know about is there a diet that God wants his people to be participating with and doing because what, what we take in affects our thinking. And the devil is working his overtime. I'm telling you, he's working overtime to try to change our thinking. See, I want to know the truth on these subjects. And when you talk about it, when you say doctrine, Herb, you know people say something? Oh, we don't want to hear no doctrine. Oh, come on now. Look, every church, I don't care what they are, how independent they say they are, non-denominational, I'm not picking on, I'm just simply saying, even when you say I'm non-denominational, I'm this, I'm that, every church has its teachings. Am I right, Pastor? Every church, no matter what they are, Baptist, Church of God, Adventist, everybody has their kind of little teachings that they have. But you know what? Only way we can have unity is to come together on these things, and the only way we can come together on it is to be willing to sit down and take a few minutes and study. I'm serious. This is it. And then when you have the, oh, I wish we had more time to talk about it. Three minutes was nice, and thank you for it, but it's not enough. Okay. Not being ungrateful. You know what I'm talking about. Why? Because of the new 
So let's, say, let's talk about the new people for a minute. New people may be coming in that hasn't heard this kind of stuff. It's too much. Let me tell you why I go ahead and just say what I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to say in the way it's said. Because I know that God knew you were going to be here if you're upset today. Does that make sense? God knows who's going to be at every meeting. And God doesn't want you wounded, nor do I want you wounded. We're to bring them in and love them in. But sometimes because of our, our, we're so stale. We're so lukewarm, somebody needs to pour some hot water on us. Somebody needs to turn up the heat right now. And if, I tell you, if you're not willing to do that by the grace of God, we're not going to be part of that number. The world's difficult right now, but I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, it's going to get more difficult. And it could come so quickly and make your head swim. Here's what, here's what the apostles knew in the New Testament church, and this is what I want to be. Let's see what time is. Okay, I'm doing, still doing good. The new converts. When new converts came into the church, there was such thing that the New Testament church preached this, gospel order. Does that make sense? There has to be gospel order in God's last day church. This would be an identifying mark of his last day church. Huh. The apostles surrounded themselves with these new converts and gospel order, meaning that the churches were organized. Few people started studying the word of God, and all of a sudden, let's start a church over here. They started a church over there. They started another church over there. But interesting, they were teaching and believing the same thing. Even, oh boy, Kenny, be careful. Even in Adventism today, you're not going to get the same message in every church. I'm not happy about that. I'm discouraged about it. It hurts my heart. And I can't figure out why. But let me say, remember what we said here? As the, as the New Testament church is getting ready to give birth, right? New Testament, Jesus getting ready to be born. The dragon stood over him dragon stands over each one of us today seeking whom he may devour by God's grace we said no you can't have me you know I have what I have Jesus they organized the New Testament church organized into different offices and different officers to keep the church pure and clean they prayed together they studied the word of God together now we say no we don't have time to study Listen carefully. This is the Acts of the Apostle, page 185, 186. What I was just talking about here, plus a whole lot more. It says, this was in harmony, what we're talking about, getting the new converts, right? Bringing everybody together, study these things through to see. And there'll be some who study them through and say, well, I'm not in agreement. No, why are you so afraid? Nobody's locking you in. Nobody's putting handcuffs on you. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. Isn't that right? If I don't like it, I don't have to do it. But why not say, man, these people seem like maybe there's something to this. I better find out because your soul destiny, your soul destiny depends upon whether you find out or not. That's why God said study to show yourself approved unto God. Your past and what you believed and what you've done, what I've done, avails nothing. I hope that makes sense. How are you with God today? Remember, to him that knoweth to do good, what is it, and doeth not, to him it is sin. Did you get it? To him that knoweth to do good. So today, if you know to do the right thing and you're not doing it, that's sin. That's what the Bible says. I don't want that in my life, and I know you don't either. Notice, this was in harmony with the gospel plan of you know, uniting in one body all believers in Christ. How in the world are we going to ever get united? The Bible says it, isn't that right? Can I say that? John 17, Jesus prayed for that we be right together in one accord. But how can we be one accord? Some things you should, can I just say, some things you should, you know, uh, you should have a, a certain Bible study night. Some believers say you've got to come to Sabbath school. Some say you've got to be to worship hour. Some say you've got to, there's just so much difference and not even getting into the Word of God. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as we see the day approaching. If you don't see it, bless your heart. Man, I see it's coming together right now. Paul had a lot to say about the church, did he not? He had a lot to say. Now listen, if Paul, if you believe that he's the apostle of Jesus Christ, right? He was called of Christ. It's funny how everybody listens to Paul when it's things they want to hear. And when he begins to say, hey, this is the way it is. The law is holy, it's just, and it's good. You know, oh, the law is spiritual, and I'm carnal. Nobody wants to hear They scratch it out. But here Paul says he's, throughout his ministry, everything he did, he, he, he labored to bring people to Christ and pointed them to the Savior of the world like we should do. Even when there was just a few in number, they still came together and they set themselves up and organized to be part of the work 
And certainly the work to help this finished right now. We're talking about finishing the work so Jesus can come. So there, Matthew 18, 20, should help us two or three are gathered together. So what about the new members? I thought it was interesting. The new members had been faithfully, thoroughly instructed in the Word of God. Do you notice when you read Paul and his writings, he was always doing what? Wanting to instruct and to teach the people so that, listen, we're on the same page. There's maybe some of us here that's not even in the same book. I'm sure that's not the issue, but if I say it like that, some of them will get the point. You know what I mean. We've got to be on the same page. They were faithfully instructed the way of the Lord, and we pray that's what's going on right here. They were fully instructed to walk the way that he walked. You remember, what was it, 1 John 2, 6? Walk the way he walked. You can't go wrong if you walk the way Jesus walked. How is it today we say, well, this is what Jesus did. This is what he did while he was here on earth. This is what he taught when he was here. This is how the people responded when he's here. And we say, oh, well, what's wrong? Have we lost our way? I pray not. Careful training of the new converts was an important factor. And you know. Listen, it was remarkable if the church was instructed and they were taught the church grew, and they prospered. Paul will tell you that. Paul's telling you that. But when we're not together on things and we don't understand. Listen, Paul and Barnabas, man, what a, what a, what a pair. Preaching the word of God. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But everywhere they went, there was people that was added. How about you? How about me? Now we can see clearly why Jesus said, go ye therefore and do what? Come on, Matthew, what is it? Matthew uh, 28, 19. Jesus said, first thing he said. Now, are you, do you want to throw it out today? Jesus said, do you want to throw it out today? Thank you. Well, there's two in here. Will there be three? Let's do it. Matthew 28. Is that what it says? Verse 28, verse 19. He said, first of all, he looked at the disciples before he left the earth, right? One of the last things he said to the disciples, he said, go teach. Is that what he said? He said, go teach. And then you baptize. Go, right, give instructions. Get on the same page together. Learn what truth really is. Quit going back and forth and all the old stuff all the years ago. Blah, 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 blah. Today is a new day in Jesus Christ. But the Bible is the same truth that's always been there. God, God, help us to understand what these truths and these doctrines, teachings, that's what they are. It's the teachings. What kind of a church, what kind of church would this be? I don't think, I couldn't stand it. What kind of a church would this be if Brother Mark got up on and, Sabbath, and taught Sabbath school and he taught something entirely different than what I believe is truth? Well, me and him would have to sit down and discuss these things, isn't that right? But if I, nothing was ever said, and then I get up here and I say something totally the opposite, who are you going to believe? That is called confusion. Confusion, right, in God's last day church. There is no confusion in God's last day church because they have been studying and they know what truth is. They take time out to find out. As we said all the time, hell fire and what happens when you die. You say, well, you talk about that all the time. It's because people still read the word of God and they still can't get it. Maybe it's because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Could it possibly be? I just want to throw it out to you. I don't want you to get mad at me. But when... This is teaching, and the different members are teaching something else. The preacher is teaching something else. That's not God's church. That is not God's church. That's Babylon. That's confusion. Notice second selected message is 392. This little book has a paragraph here. It says this. All should see the necessity of understanding the truth for themselves. Individually, we must understand, listen carefully, the doctrines that have been studied out carefully and prayerfully. You remember the Bible there? I was Timothy, I think it is talking about. I said that it's talking about the doctrines of, of God, the doctrines of Jesus. There's nothing wrong with doctrine, it's simply as a teaching. We need to understand. Remember, one member can't preach and teach this, and another one do the other thing, and the other, and the other, and the other. It becomes very confused. I just didn't say to what? Sit down, study it out, and look at it from the light of God's word. That, listen, does the enemy want, does the enemy want unity in the church, God's church? No, he doesn't. He, no. Yeah, he doesn't want it, so he's going to do everything that he can to prevent it. Huh. But when the light shines on God's Word, 
we must take a positional stance. Right? And we need to be praying for that unity. Ephesians 4, 3 through 5 talks about this. This is what Paul said. Listen, church. One body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, how is it that we've got hundreds and thousands of different things? Again, I'm not trying to criticize somebody going a different direction. I'm simply saying our willingness to sit down and see. Because somebody disagrees and says, well, I think this is what it teaches over here. I'm going to say, where do you get that? Show me. No, don't just, no, no. Don't just say, this is what I hear. This is what the pastor told me. This is what the evangelist. Are you still with me? I'm over talking to myself over here. I might as well. I think you see what I'm talking about here. I'm willing to say, show me from God's word. Then I'll have the opportunity. Then I'll show you the way I think that it says in the word of God. And then we go from there and see by God's grace there's some unity. Listen, when the New Testament church was set up, God's church, his true church was set up. You know what? There are many who came in just like all different denominations or different beliefs. But when they came in, the spirit of the Holy Ghost Right, The Spirit of the living God got a hold of these people. They let all those preconceived ideas. I thought this is the way we were taught. This is what I heard. They threw them out the window. Isn't that wonderful? They threw them out the window. These false views, they had to go. They had to be corrected as they learned what truth is. Hearts are going to be united. Love for each other is going to be growing. Faith in Jesus is going to increase. I can say this for certain. Let me say that if you get nothing else out of today, I'm going to say this for certain. Disunity, are you there? Disunity is a sure sign that the Holy Spirit is absent. That's it. That's just simple, the truth. That doesn't belong to any certain denomination or group. That's just the truth. For people who don't know any better, they say a lot of times, well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a Baptist view. Oh, that's a Seventh-day Adventist view. I don't care about the Baptist view. I don't care about the Seventh-day Adventist view, but I do care about the Word of God. How about you? I'm not trying to be ugly about that, but I want to open our hearts and our minds and say it doesn't matter what somebody else. I'm worried about what is it in God's Word here that I can be a child of God. Boy, the Bible talks about here. And there was war in heaven, Revelation 12, 7. There was war in heaven. John presented a brief history, the great controversy between Christ and Christ. And Satan, right? As it began in heaven, as it ends here on this earth. Remember, the dragon has come down, the devil has come down to persecute a specific people. He was cast out because he wouldn't obey God's laws. Is that true? He wouldn't obey what God says. He was cast out. If we do not obey what God says in his word, we think we're going to make it to the heaven. We need to rethink the issues. I'm not trying to judge you. I just uh, Maybe nobody here that really... But the Bible says Satan was cast out, that old dragon, Revelation 12, 9, the old devil, right? Cast out to this earth. Huh. Why, would it, why is this called the red dragon? Think about it. Because the red dragon, what did he do? He persecuted and he killed God's people. He was bloodthirsty. He's still bloodthirsty today. He has not changed. He's after your blood. Is that true? It is. He'd get rid of you right now if he possibly could, but by the protection of God. Isn't that wonderful? The angels of heaven were still here today. Praise the Lord for that. The Bible says he came down to this earth, that great red dragon. Huh. Satan working through pagan Rome, as we well know. Ruling the world at that time of, of Christ's birth. The dragon, the devil there in Revelation 12, 4, stood before the woman that we talked about, ready to devour the child as soon as it was what? As soon as we were born. Remember, it's always been the purpose of the dragon of the devil is to destroy God's people. Not just, not just a professed. I'm a professing Christian. That means diddly. Can I say that? No, seriously. It, it doesn't mean you can profess all you want. I can profess and tell you I can jump up here to the moon, but I can't do it. We can profess a lot of things. It's actions and our lifestyle. He's always wanted to get rid of God's last day people. Revelation 12, 17. This is finally this. Remember, it reads right. some of you may have never heard it before. Bless your heart. Maybe too much for you. But the death decree. You can see the way things are working in the world right now. That It's, it's lining up to where what? If, if you say, if you quote scripture from right on the internet, certain places, two years in prison or five years in prison. You can't give away Christian books there in Canada. A lot of, you can't give away the great controversy. You can't give away certain books like that. 
because people say it's very hurtful. You can't talk against another denomination. You can't talk. You can talk against error. I can tell you that right now. That's what the Bible says. And that was, it's not against a certain people. God has good people. We understand everywhere. But again, he's calling them out. And so the time is coming. The enemy's making right now to laws to where he's trying to do his best to get rid of the people of God. Who was the, who was the enemy aggravated with? The people of God. Remember, you read this. You've been doing it in your, your Bible study. Revelation 12, verse 17. Somebody pay attention. Revelation 12, verse 17, and says the dragon mm, was wroth with the woman. He was angry with the woman. Who's the woman? The devil was angry at the church and went to make war. Notice this. Make war with this guy over here. Make war with this over here. Well, he says he's making war with everybody. He doesn't make war with you after you've chosen his side. Are you still there? He'll use you and use you up until you're no good to him anymore, and then he'll try to get rid of you. Are you still with me? That's the way he operates. You know that. He went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, notice who he went to make war with. Who is specifically mad at? Those who keep the commandments of God and have what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. There's two identifying marks. Please don't ever come up and say, this to me, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll fuss back with you. Well, there's one identifying mark. We go to church on the seventh day. Uh-uh. It says two identifying marks. It has to meet all of those identifying marks. Or it's not God slash church. The devil was angry and went to make war with those who keep the commandments by the grace of God. Do you get it? The red dragon is angry. He was angry with God. He's angry with Jesus. You know what? They defeated him. Praise God for that. Now, the dragon knows he can't defeat the Godhead. Praise the Lord for that. So now he's angry at what? God's people. Mm. So the enemy makes war with this group. The leftover. Just a little part. Just a remnant of this little group, huh? By the grace of God. Notice that two things, what is it? S set them apart. Two things set God's last day church apart from all the other churches and denominations in the world if you want to talk about it. Professed Christian. They keep the commandments of God and they have what? Testimony, testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? It's very simple. Revelation 19.10. It says it's the spirit of prophecy. So what is the identifying mark of the remnant church? To be clear, the word prophecy describes any inspired message, message given by God you know, to, to an individual. That maybe is a prophet or a prophetess. It's, it's to be used today. So what does that say to us? God's last day church, keep all the commandments. So Now, if you're looking for God's church today, the true church, can I just be bold? And, uh, you can throw stuff if you want to. If you're looking for God's true church, you don't go out, oh boy, you, don't, you, go, you go out on the seventh day Sabbath. You don't go out on Sunday. You say we're God's last day church, everybody say we're the remnant. I know everybody said, almost every church said we're the remnant. The remnant will keep all the commandments of God. So how many churches, denominations claim to keep all of the commandments? They claim nine. They don't claim ten. That's what the Bible says. So if you're looking for God's last day church, you'll go out on Saturday to look for it, not Sunday. Not trying to be hurtful about it, but that's the truth. It makes it very simple then to find out. Spirit of prophecy, manifestation of the Holy Spirit working through a representative of God. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about it, 7 through 10. Listen carefully. This is a very important point before we close today. Just a few more minutes. I jotted this down. The testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy. You see, when you say that sometimes, absolutely people just almost cringe. The hair stands up on the back of their neck. Even, even Adventists. And some of them say, oh, well, oh, we, <laughs> you know why a lot of times? Because the spirit, come on somebody, because the spirit of prophecy starts digging into little personal things that we have in our own life, little sins that we have that the Bible doesn't specifically call it out. Principle is there, no doubt about it. But it calls out these certain little things that's not pleasing in the sight of God and certainly backs up, the Word of God backs it up. And they don't want that. They don't want to be exposed. As Rome doesn't want to be exposed today, as you well know. Testimony is spirit of prophecy. In view of the fact, listen, this is an important fact. In view of the fact of Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth with a woman, right? This verse specifically refers to the church God's church after the close of the 1260 days, verses 6 and 14. Does that make sense? 
the church, not well way before. So if you say, well, I tell our church, our denomination, we, were, we come about in the 1600s, you're not God's remnant. We came in the 1700s, can't be God's remnant. God's remnant church had to be at the close of the dark ages where the woman was in the wilderness for 1,260 days or years in Bible, right? After 1798, that's when that prophecy ends. It's, it's proven fact is when it ends. That's what we look at at the time of the end. So God's true church would surface after 1798. If you think surface before that, it can't possibly be. So the spirit and the gift of prophecy is for the New Testament church or the church of our day. Specifically for our day when people say, oh, no, it can't be. God has always had prophets leading and guiding his church through the beginning of time, and he'll have them all the way to the end. Lord, have mercy. If we ever needed extra help, it's now. You know that. It's not nothing new from the Word of God. It's the same truth. It's just magnifying glass to help us to look at it. Principles always there. I've been reading the books my life for 40 years. I've never found a discrepancy in it yet. You might try to find one if you're looking for one, but there's none that I can, I can find that changes any doctrine or teaching from the Word of God. No new, listen, another, no New Testament writer. Are you still with me? No New Testament writer suggests the gift of prophecy was to end at the apostolic church. None of them said, oh, it's going to end. We say, oh, well, it's not in the church. Yes, it is. God says it's in the church. It'll be in his last day church. Ephesians 4.11 says it will continue. Do you do that? Till we come into unity and faith and knowledge of the Son of God. Are we, do we have that kind of unity now? We're looking for it. We're praying for it. No, we don't have it. But the gift of prophecy, spirit of prophecy, the prophet will operate in God's last day church till we all come what? To the unity the knowledge and to a perfect man. To the measure of the statue of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple points here real quick as we close. I would like to do it about the prophets. I won't do it. God's last day church, quickly. Six, seven points. God's true church, the red dragon is angry with, appears after we made the point 1798. Isn't that right? After the 1,260 years of the wilderness. Everybody knows that's the dark ages. I mean, that's just history. Just, just read of these things. So the church will go come in after that. Huh. So, and, and it... It will keep the commandments, all ten, including the Sabbath. So if you're not preaching keeping the seventh-day Sabbath, you can't possibly be God's last day church. It just can't be because of keeping all the commandments. That's the fourth one. I mean, think about the audacity that man has to say, I can take the fourth commandment out. You're doing the same thing that the devil tried to do. Isn't that right? Set in God's place. Please don't do that. Number three, you're going to teach the same truth as the disciples and Jesus taught. Amen. See, if you do that, you're on You're on line. You're going to proclaim the three angels' message. How many churches do you know of, besides Seventh-day Adventists, that proclaim the three angels' message to? Not a one. God said you're going to give these three messages to warn the world that I'm coming. That's an identifying mark of God's church right there. If we're not doing it, we can't possibly be as much as you'd like to think so, Revelation 14. It is a worldwide movement. What do you think with 3ABN and all there? We believed in the very beginning that this message had to go around the world. Isn't that right? It goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, and, and people. And you say, no, the church, well, it doesn't go. We kind of have, have a good time when we come. You can't possibly be God's church because the Bible says so. That's why. They teach the everlasting gospel and certainly salvation through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Is it take time that maybe sometime we, by the grace of God, get off what we call our high horses and we come down and just start reading the word of God and say, this is what God's word says. This is what I'm willing to do. We talk about a born-again Christian. born-again Christian is one who is teachable. You know, I still want, I'm, I want to be teachable. I'm learning all the time through these things. But I see it more than ever before. We must take a stand. If we don't, we will be swept away. If you don't do you think it's tough right now, it's going to get tougher on the people of God. Now, cling to Him right now, right? He will give you faith. He'll give you encouragement. He'll give you strength for the days that lie ahead that I can't hardly bear some time to look at. You see him from Scripture, and you know it, and you say, oh, Lord, have mercy on us. I'm not where I need to be. My family's not where they need to be. We need to wake up, and I need to wake up to the very fact and begin to talk about these things that we're talking about right now. Things right now that will stir. You know who it will stir? It will stir the people of God who are interested in finding out what's truth, and they will only make angry those who don't want to hear it. Isn't that what happened when Jesus taught it? People who heard it loved it, and then the other, let's kill him, right? People of his own faith said what? Let's kill him. That should not stop us from presenting what we know is truth. The great red dragon is still alive today. 
He's after you. He's after me. But he is a defeated foe if simply you and I, if simply we will simply follow what God has said in his word and be identified. You're going, somebody's going to have to stand up and say, I want to be identified with the last day church. I want to be identified. How do you do it? It's very simple in here. Isn't that what it says? It's seven little points. It's what you, they keep the commandments of God. So we don't go around and say it doesn't matter whether we keep the commandments or, well, we'll keep nine of them. We'll, you know, substitute the, you know, the fourth and we'll put Sunday in there. And so, uh, oh, so fraudulent. Somebody put the Lord day, Lord's day. The Lord's day is the seventh day Sabbath. In the time that we, in case somebody's confused about that. Pastor, you know that some of the Sunday churches will say, well, we go on the Lord's day. The Lord's day is not Sunday. It's not Monday. It's the seventh day Sabbath. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That's what the Bible says. And so, I mean, I'm just, I'm not trying to be hard about it. It's just, it's so hurtful inside. We see people who are just willing to sit and just listen and then not do a thing about it. They'll be held accountable. Absolutely. I'll be held accountable. We're held accountable for what we know, what we understand. If you think the message is going to be easy, you know, it's not going to be here in this church. Think about it. You want to be, you know, patted on the head and put a little sugar on everything. It's just, it, just, it can't be. We're too close to the end. Our lives need to be squared away. Sin has to go. We have to be like Jesus. And I read about the Bible and the apostles and all. I see my fall so short. And I don't want to fall short. And then I look at the one that I'm supposed to match up to is Jesus Christ. And I really fall short. But he's my example. You can be saved today. Jesus said, I have kept my Father's commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Case closed. Amen. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for your precious word today. I realize we went a little bit long, Lord, but we know the Holy Spirit is touching all of our hearts and all of our lives. Things may be said that were sharp. It's not meant to hurt your people. It won't. It will just simply gouge us a little bit to maybe wake us up. To realize that we are just in the last minutes, as it were, seconds of this world's history. It could very well be. There's wars and rumors of wars. Things are going on right now. There's attack upon the Bible. There's attack upon, you talk about healthful things, mandates, all these kind of things that are going on that, that shouldn't be going on today. The attack on religious freedom, religious speech, and our conscience. And Lord, we, we, we've got to rally around when they begin to fight this free speech and being able to express how we feel about you and what your word says. We need to fight. It's the enemy. There's no doubt about it. So, Lord, give us grace and strength and faith and knowledge and wisdom to be able to go ahead and fight the good fight of faith because you said ye are my witnesses to the world. I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, those who have made a decision today, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.